Well, once again, we dabble into into uh, very morbid affairs on Game of Thrones. And how appropriate the, the show should be titled Game of Thrones, because there were several uh, game-changing developments that happened this episode. Things will never go back to status quo. I think we've known that for a while, but here is where we get further proof of that. Because I think this record set, I think this episode sets a new record for most main slash supporting characters getting axed off at once. <laughs> I mean, yeah, obviously this show is not is not at all shy about about killing off about killing off its characters any time. But good god, I think like four people died this this time around. Okay, so there were things about it that really worked, like that are that are just art house film worthy. And there and there are uh, ele other elements of it that did not work so well, where where we either where we either dealt with characters that that uh, were not as interesting, or were just not handled with as much clarity as there could have been. Now the episode starts off with just immediately after the last one left off, Jon Snow is going to kill the leader of the Wildlings, uh, Siren Hines. All right, so. So he's going to do that, and all of a sudden Stannis Baratheon comes out of nowhere with the cavalry. <laughs> um, and just completely wipes out the wildlings. I mean, they are they are outnumbered. They are they they are the victims of a surprise attack, obviously, because cavalry. Um, they're outflanked. So so yeah, obviously the wildlings surrender because because once again, getting some depth into into these guys besides just, oh, bloodthirsty uh, savages. Um, Mance, I believe the guy's name is, he basically said, basically says, we we just want to get out of the north, dude. He says to Jon Snow, I like this this kind of uh, more civil exchange between him and Jon Snow. Um, shows that they uh, are not necessarily above civility despite all of the blood that has been lost and there were losses on both sides as they drink to. Um, so, so I enjoyed that little exchange. It was kind of a, um, it was it was kind of a welcome chivalrous exchange in a world that seems completely free of chivalry. And and what is what's ironic is that is that this exchange comes from someone who is deemed by many to be just this savage uh, wildling. So, don't really know what that says about uh, about the rest of the people in Westeros, but. There you go. Um, but this was one of the aspects of the episode that I think could have been handled with a little bit more clarity because Stan Baratheon essentially commandeers the uh, the Night's Watch post, the the Castle Black, because he comes in with his army, at, and on the advisement on the advisement of the red-haired chick Melisandre, I believe her name is, he uh, he positions his army, his new his newly acquired army, that he got from the Iron Bank. He positions his newly acquired army at the wall to to presumably reinforce against whatever kind of winter is coming. Which we as the audience know is probably going to be the Willie Nelson looking zombie guys. So so we never really got got too much into what the new status quo is going to be at the wall, what, what is going to become of the remaining members of the Night's Watch, if they're going to be relieved of duty, um, if they are going to try and find a place inside Stannis' army, I don't know. But, but it was uh, appropriately a time for lament, given the big battle last in the, in the previous episode. So... <clears throat> Two parts of the episode that I think did not work, or at least not work as well, is a the stuff with Bran Stark. I know I'm kind of a broken record on in saying in saying his name is Bland Stark, but you know I just I don't know what it is. I mean I get people telling me you know you know you just you just don't understand. I mean if you've read the books, then then you'll know that Bran is closer to the true conflict than anyone and. 
And, you know, this could have a lot of potential because he is discovering this hidden, um, this hidden power that no one else is aware of. And he is, and he is interacting with these, I don't even know what they are. They, they're like sprites or nymphs. I don't know what they are, but, um, but the three-eyed raven, he's interacting with a three-eyed raven and this, uh, this little, uh, this, this, uh, little thing that's just called the child. Or one of the children that are who are supposedly here before men, who I swear to God, this thing had a digital face. I swear to God. If not, then it must be something with the makeup. But I was getting serious, uncanny valley vibes from this from this kid. Um. But right before they get to this sacred place, I don't even know what it is because you know, Bran is so boring that I just don't care. Um. I know you're going to make. I know I'm going to get some negative uh, press for that or negative comments for that. You know, you, know, you should have paid attention. I know it's he's supposed to be on some spirit quest. I, I just don't care. I just don't care. I mean, despite how important he is supposed to be, from a dramatic standpoint, and from from the perspective of emotional investment, especially in relation to all the other characters, the show should not stop completely dead when whenever he's on screen. For any reason. I mean, this should be one of the most interesting characters in the show, and he is just boring. I mean, maybe that has something to do with, with the fact that his plotline is just so distant from everyone else's, even the supposed real conflict that uh, that Stannis is trying to tackle in the in the ice zombies. Uh, or maybe it's because, because this kid, Isaac uh, Hampstead Wright, just is not a very good actor. I, I don't know, but but he and his friends, he and his uh, he and his weird spirit quest buddies are attacked by by the skeletons from Jason and the Argonauts, minus the stop motion, and uh, and add a whole bunch of CG or CGI. So they're attacked by these Jason and the Argonauts skeletons, and Jojen, I think they said his name was the blonde guy. He's killed off, and again, I, I wish I cared, but I don't. Because what, what personality have we gotten out of this guy? Really, just, just taking my bias with this whole storyline out of it. What personality, and what in the way of dramatic investment have we gotten out of this kid? Why should I care about this kid in relation to the numerous other more interesting characters on the show? You know, like Jon Snow, Tyrion Lannister, all those guys. And you may think I'm being unfair, like, oh, this kid's just a supporting character. But even the supporting characters, like Bronn and the Hound, I I feel so much more for than than Jojen. And when Jojen is killed off, I that should elicit that should elicit more of an emotion from me than just eh. Now that's really all I did when when he was stabbed in the in the gut with by the skeletons. It's just eh. <sighs> but yeah, no telling where they're going to go from there. I mean, all we all we get is that Bran is going to receive some kind of Jedi training to hone his uh, his special skills as the Chosen One or some or something. I don't know. He's going to learn to fly, so he might he may not have to be carried around by Hodor. So that may provide him with some new material to make him potentially more interesting. But you know, we'll see. But really, the points where this episode really shined. Were A, the stuff with Arya and the Hound, and B, the stuff with dealing with uh, with Tyrion, and the initiatives that he finally took. But first of all, Arya and the Hound. First of all, I have two little gripes with this scene. A, I found it extremely hard to believe that even with his injury, the Hound, someone as big and tough as the Hound, would lose to... Brienne, and I know Brienne is 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 nearly as big, but first of all, first of all, the Hound is this big burly guy. Brienne, even though she is a a very strong woman, she is a woman, and I I'm not trying to sound sexist or anything, but you know, to be able to to be able to uh, to topple a man, a woman would have to would have to become stronger than the man, and I don't think Brienne is stronger than the man. Uh, and I know I'm not really making much sense from 
from <laughs> from a lot of people's standpoints. But you know, ju judging by what we've, I'm just saying, judging by what we've seen so far from these characters. <laughs> I don't know, I just don't think that Brienne would be able to beat the Hound. And in reality, she didn't. She was losing, and she decided to play dirty. Which, you know, just... It may just be me, because I like the Hound better than I like Brienne of Tarth. Again, again, sue me. Sue me, but I think the Hound is a lot more interesting. I think he... I enjoy his perspective on the world. Is very his very uh, realistic perspective on on this very harsh world rather than I like Brienne's perspective which we haven't really seen a whole lot of. I mean, she's just she hasn't really taken any any initiative of her own as of yet. I mean, yeah, she's she's obviously a likable character and she's obviously, and I obviously don't want to see anything happen to her, but really she's just been in servitude and the Hound has actually moved past that to where he's his own guy now. Um, or he was his own guy, so so yeah, A, I didn't, I didn't want to see him go, and B, I don't think Brienne, in any kind of fair scenario, could beat him. And really, she didn't. Like I said, she played dirty. She kept hitting with the rock, she bit his ear. So, yeah. Yeah, she, she, she resorted to desperation, to desperate tactics when she was losing. Um, and also, what I found kind of hard to believe was that Arya, despite the fact that the show has, has done basically done a really good job establishing her as this very cold-blooded assassin. I find it hard to believe that after all she's been through, after all the Hound has done for her, after all he has taught her, and after all the times he has saved her life, I find it hard to believe that she does not grant him that last mercy of a, a quick death. I mean, he is sitting there bleeding out, he, he can't move, and he's basically begging her to kill him. And yeah, obviously their relationship hasn't really been, like, best buddies, but... But again, you'd think there would be some type of... <laughs> you'd think there would be some type of, uh... Honorable death... In question here, and I think... Uh, I... I don't know, it's, it was kind of in character in that she's very cold-blooded, but at the same time, at the same time, it kind of diminishes her likability just a little bit, because, because like I said, does she have no semblance of gratitude? Although one could argue, I might just be answering my own question by saying this, one could argue that given how, how much of a harsh reality that she has, that she has had to uh, deal with for now three seasons, three complete seasons, and also how how much the haunt, Hound has taught her about about uh, a, a hard life. Basically, throughout throughout all of this season, you could argue that maybe this is in character. Maybe maybe you know just stuff happens, buddy, and I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to leave you to a painful death. Or maybe that was her last act of vengeance. I don't know. But again. After all they've been through, I just thought that would count for something. But aside from that, it's played very well by by Rory McCann, Rory McCann and Maisie Williams because he's he's sitting there, kind of kind of it's like it's like in Wrath of Khan. I spit my last breath at thee, and and she's just kind of sitting there giving him that cold stare, and it's not like. It's not like some some people who just who just can't register an emotion. She she's she's registering an emotion. She is she looks very distant. I mean, she's looking at this guy, and she. If Maisie Williams does not does not go on to to other things after this, then there really is no justice in Hollywood because she is giving great performance after great performance. I've even heard that some people, or a lot of people, including Ashley Johnson, um, don't don't take my direct word on this, but but a lot of people want her to be to play Ellie in the supposedly in development movie of The Last of Us video game. I can kind of see that, but I'm getting off track off track here. That scene is beautifully played. No music. Um, which I think makes it all the more visceral, it makes it all the more real. And and even the fight between the Hound and Brienne was 
pretty visceral. I mean, I mean, it reminds me of the fight between uh, between Anast Anastasia and the other the other guy near the end of season one of Banshee. How they just they just fight until both of them just get tired, and both of them are getting more tired and more tired um, until one of them just finally goes down, or at least falls off a cliff. And the other scene that that's really made this episode shine, even among even considering all of the great episodes we've had of this show, the other scene that really that really impressed me was the scene where Tyrion, again with barely a word of dialogue and with no music, sees that sees that his father has committed the ultimate wrong against him. Not only did he sentence his own son to death, but he is now sleeping with his son's whore. And right at that point, and you can see it written plainly on Peter Dinklage's face, you can see the pain, the anguish, and then that subtly turning to anger, to where, to where you never doubt for a second that this guy is thinking, okay, these, these people need to die. They need to die. There's, there's just no getting around it. He jeopardizes his, his own potential for freedom and escape from execution so he can, so he can, uh, take this final, take this final initiative against those who have wronged him in the form of, in the form of Shay and his dad, which his dad gets probably one of the most humiliating deaths on the show. I mean, he dies on the pot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, f for as dignified as Ned Stark's death was, <laughs> for as dignified as Ned Stark's death was, I can't. It, I would be hard pressed to think of a more embarrassing way for Tywin to go out than just being shot with two, two arrows on the crapper. Um, yeah, so at least it was quiet. <laughs> and and once again, the way that scene kind of builds. And the way it builds without without any use of music again, I mean it's just very quiet, just just letting the scene play, just letting Peter Dinklage, just letting Charles dance, just letting Sybil uh, Kahili or something, uh, the woman who plays Shay, just letting them work, just letting them work and not doing anything else aside from the camera work, which. Which the camera work even complemented their performances. The camera work had these really long shots. It had these very slow pans. It was just, it was just the, it was just right. It was the perfect setting for this scene. So yeah, that I'm glad Game of Thrones went out on a high note, except for the stuff with Bran Stark and again the stuff with, the stuff with Daenerys. And I'm not just saying that because of uh, Amelia Clark's. Uh, performance. It's not a terrible performance, but it's not really anything special. I know I'm opening up a can of worms by saying that. Um, but but honestly, in that scene where she chains up her dragons, um, I could have wept at that scene if they had gotten a stronger actress, but you know, my guess is they don't want to fire Amelia Clark four seasons in and replace her with someone else, someone probably better. <laughs> Again, I'm opening up a huge can of worms by saying that because I know a lot of people really love her as Daenerys Stormborn, and again, a lot of people may think she really fits the book. But me, just as a general casual fan of the show, she doesn't really do a whole lot for me. So her stuff didn't really work, and even the material, and again, it's not just because of her, it's just because the material seemed a little repetitive in terms of what we've seen so far, because it... Once again, she is meeting with some repercussions of her supposed uh, fight for the liberation of slaves. Um, she has robbed a lot of people of their livelihood. Um, she's trying to amend it, but really, she might have to face facts that she's doing more harm than good, especially with her, with the pretty idiotic move to have her dragons roaming around, roaming around freely and killing, killing not only livestock at this point, but actual children. Uh... Yeah, yeah, aside from a few minor flaws in some of the story yeah, in some of the weaker storylines, this this episode was one of the strongest we've had all season. And yeah, I'm probably going to do I I don't know, prop I might do a predictions video for season four. 
especially since I haven't read the books, and, you know, I can just go off what the show seems to be setting up. So, yeah. Good to see it went on on a high note. Who knows where everyone is going to end up from here. And I will talk to you later.